Hey, how's it going? That was so dumb. I apologize. <laughs> hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back. Nice to have a video that actually uploads on time, isn't it? Yep, I appreciate that. <laughs> Welcome back. We've got another lesson for you guys today. This time we're going to be covering tone. I just like hitting a whiteboard. I don't know why. Hopefully I'm not making a bunch of people angry. <laughs> actually, we're going to cover tone, mood, and imagery today. Uh, I realized that I didn't clarify which uh, section this is supposed to go in, so uh, uh, we'll say reading comprehension notes, although there are so many portions here that kind of like get into writing a little bit, because we're going to talk about ways to uh, improve your writing a little bit with imagery, and we're also going to practice uh, some imagery writing uh, today as well. So first off, let's get into this. Tone is going to be the attitude towards the subject conveyed in a literary work. Uh, think of tone as something that is constantly kind of built up. There's not one thing that generates tone. Uh, it's this amalgamation, this combination of a number of things. Um, figurative language helps with that. Imagery helps with that thing along those lines. Okay. Tone can be something that is uh, perhaps mirthful, sarcastic, joyful, things like that. Think of adverbial sort of elements. Uh, tone is really kind of the author's take on things, kind of the message that they want to convey or the attitude they want to convey about something. Uh, the comparison I always like to make is that uh, war can be presented in two different ways, right? War can be presented as being something that is very chivalrous, valiant, and heroic. So the tone is reflective of that. That they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! But war can also be portrayed as something that's very violent, um, saddening, depressing, and has a negative impact. Then Bubba said something I won't ever forget. I wanna go home. Bubba was my best good friend. So that's again, those differences between those two are gonna come down to tone. Right? Tone is really important in establishing a relationship between the reader and the author because the ideas that are conveyed are gonna come as a result of that tone. And knowing kind of what the author wants to intend with that is gonna be really critical. Okay? Oftentimes, tone is gonna be one of those things that's kind of like vague and fuzzy to nail down specifically. So being able to link it to specific parts of the text is gonna be really important. Okay. I would say that in a lot of cases, right, we can talk about some of the situations from Life of Pi where the way that something is presented tonally is gonna to be different based on what's going on. So being able to point those certain things out in the text is gonna be really critical. Right? So for example, we have this long passage. It was Sunday and according to custom on that day, McTeague took his dinner at two in the afternoon at the car conductor's coffee joint on Polk Street. He had thick gray soup, heavy underdone meat, very hot on a cold plate, two kinds of vegetables, and a sort of soy pudding full of strong butter and sugar. On his way back to his office one block above, he stopped at Joe Friend's saloon and bought a pitcher of steamed beer. It was his habit to leave the pitcher there on his way to dinner. So everything about this particular passage doesn't read anything specific. It doesn't read anything out there. It's very just plain, just very normal, right? It's almost like trying to convey this idea that everything to do with McTeague is just very plain and boring, right? And there's not much to this particular guy in any particular way, right? Nothing special about him, right? So the tone of this passage is so very straightforward and so very banal almost that it's kind of conveying that image, right? Breaking everything down real short, right? Hot, cold, thick, strong, warm, underdone. Right? It's just straightforward and normal. Right? By conveying it that way, it's basically telling you how routine and how normal this guy's life is. We shouldn't take anything special from it based on the words that are chosen there. Tone is very different, though, than mood. All right? Mood is something that, in, that boosts tone. All right? Mood is going to be that feeling that pervades a part of a work. It's the atmosphere. It's the effect of all those things conveyed forward. Think of mood as being what the reader or the author wants you, the reader, to feel, all right? So if we go back to that war analogy, right? They make the, they make the, may make, oh my God. They may make the mood of the passage very like unsettling because they're giving the tone of how horrible war can be. So you feel those senses of gruesomeness and, and uncomfortableness, right? And discomfort. Um, and it's helping boost that tone that they're trying to get across, right? So think of mood as being one of those things that boosts that tone because they want you to feel a certain way based on their opinions and what they're trying to perceive. 
And so the mood does that for you, right? The town itself is dreary. Not much is there except the cotton mill. The two room houses where the workers live, a few peach trees, a church with two colored windows, and a miserable main street only 100 yards long. So with a lot of the word choice in here, like dreary, um, not much there, a few peach trees, a church with two colored windows, miserable main street, right? All these words trying to convey a very negative, very gloomy sense. So when you read that, you feel this sense of kind of just dread and uneasiness and not really like feeling comfortable at all. And they may be trying to convey a certain like tone of just how uh, negative things can be based on certain situations and circumstances. It's tough without a full passage to determine the tone, but the mood we can certainly determine just by some of the word choice, things like that. The big element that helps with a lot of these tone and mood things, and really with a lot of the uh, uh, things that we're going to be seeing as far as literary analysis, is going to be imagery. Okay. Imagery is going to be one of, imagery is one of my favorite things to take a look at in terms of literature. It's one of my favorite points of analysis uh, because imagery is so pervasive in works, especially good works, when you have solid imagery really elevates everything and takes it to that next level. So imagery is the use of words and phrasing to create a mental image that appeals to all five senses, right? Smell, taste, hearing, uh, vision, and sensation, feeling, right? The goal with imagery is immersion. The idea that the senses are all evoked in a, in a piece of literature to where the reader is all of a sudden taken away to a completely different place. Now, how do we do that? Figurative language helps, right? But being able to just paint a picture in all senses is what's gonna be helpful. Visual is always the one that people identify easiest because we tend to conceive the world mostly with our eyes. But when you can evoke smell and taste and hearing and sensation, um, it's gonna resonate that much more, right? And it makes us kind of feel connected to what's going on. Most imagery is gonna rely on memory and memory sensations. So we can remember how something smells and therefore it evokes it in us. Or we can remember what something looks like or we have a conception of a color. So we can conceive of it a little bit easier. Where memory fails, figurative language fills in the spaces, right? So we can say that it's like something that we have a sense memory for. Visual imagery is gonna be things experienced by sight and it often utilizes color. This example here, should look pretty similar to you guys from page 42 of Life of Pi. If you took the city of Tokyo and turned it upside down and shook it, so we get this visual representation of taking the city and shaking it upside down, you'd be amazed at the animals that would fall out. It would pour more than cats and dogs. We have the idiom of rain and cats and dogs. Boa constrictors, big snake, Komodo dragons. Yep, we get an idea of those. Crocodiles, we know what those look like. Piranhas, for sure. Ostriches are pretty unique. Wolves, lynxes are a big cat. Wallabies, manatees. Porcupines, orangutans, wild boar, that sort of rainfall you could expect on your umbrella. So this image of it like raining down, right? The visualization there, specifically after using that idiom of rain, cats and dogs. But notice how we use very distinct animals too, right? It's not just like bear uh, or cat or dog or anything like that. Something really unique and specific, right? A boa constrictor is a particular kind of snake, really big snake. Right, crocodile we can visualize, um, piranhas we can visualize, porcupines we can visualize, uh, manatees, right? Really distinct visual things. So when he describes them and gives you all those details, you can see it as he's talking about raining down. Just to give you the, the context of the volume of animals that would theoretically fall out of Tokyo. Auditory imagery is a good one. It's imagery experienced by hearing and relies on sound memories. So what we can remember as far as hearing something from our past or being familiar with a certain sound is gonna be evoked by that sound imagery. Because of the clanging the bells to announce one's arrival to God, because of the whine of the reedy, uh, Natasoram and the beating of drums, because of the patter of bare feet against stone floors down dark corridors, pierced by shafts of sunlight. So we may not have the first person memory of the Natasoram, which by the way, at some point I'll have to play some uh, Natasoram music for you guys or uh, some of the uh, Hindu music, it's pretty fascinating to listen to, to be honest. Uh, but we can understand the clanging of bells. We know what that sounds like. We can even think of, you know, we may get different tones and pitches of the bell, but either way, the bell comes to us by hearing that clanging. Uh, the patter of bare feet against stone floors. Maybe not stone floors, but that sound of what it means to run on a, a solid flat surface, um, like maybe tile or um, stone or something like that. 
um, and what that sounds like, right? We can imagine that memory, we can hear it as we're reading through it. And we may not necessarily know, like I said, what the Nautus Forum is, but perhaps the beating of drums, that's a very familiar sound to a lot of us. Um, and if you're in band, right, the whine of the reedy, so something that is reedy could be like an oboe or a clarinet or something along those lines, based on what we can conceive in our memory. Olfactory is one that's really strong for us because it relies on scent memory. So we conceive things very strongly when we smell them. It's kind of why like taste is controlled by that as well. So whenever we have something that smells a certain way, we already have a, a construction in our mind of what that smells like. We tend to have very strong reactions to very strong smells, which is why it works so well. So like this, in the closed humid confines of the refrigerator, the smell had had the time to develop to ferment to grow bitter and angry. It assaulted my senses with a pent up rage that made my head reel, my stomach turn, and my legs wobble. Luckily, the sea quickly filled the horror hole and the thing sank beneath the surface. The space left vacant by the departed refrigerator was filled by other trash. We left the trash behind. For a long time, when the wind came from that direction, I could still smell it. So he's talking about just how strong this particular thing smelled and how it impacted him and how he reacted to it. And this idea of it being bitter and angry, right? A little bit of personification to make that work, just how smell and strong that is. Anytime you have something that has a fermented smell to it, um, that has a really strong resonant smell. And then of course, talking about how you could still smell it, just talking about how everlasting that was. Uh, the earlier portion of this passage also does a really good job of going into the smell sensation. Gustatory is really strongly connected with uh, olfactory. Uh, gustatory has to do with your taste sensations and taste memory. Um, we don't spend a whole lot of time putting things in our mouth and tasting them, but when we do, it tends to resonate with us quite a lot. Um, <laughs> well, maybe when we're young, we did that a lot, but uh, having those taste memories and flavors really helps with us because we, um, we, we can conceive those, those sensations most strongly because it's not something we do very often, so the memories last. These biscuits were amazingly good. They were savory and delicate to the palate, neither too sweet nor too salty. They broke up under the teeth with a delightful crunching sound. Mixed with saliva, they made a granular paste that was enchantment to the tongue and mouth. And when I swallowed, my stomach had only one thing to say, hallelujah. So here, we're getting kind of an idea of how something tasted and felt in the mouth in terms of texture, but also this idea of too sweet, too salty. So it's almost like this perfect kind of mix and how savory and delicate it is, right? So it's got a little bit of like, oomph to it. It's not just like eating a dessert thing. It's got a bit of savoriness to it. And it's not too overwhelming, right? It's, a, it's like this perfect kind of biscuit. That may mean that it is the perfect recipe, or it may mean that this person is so hungry that by finally eating something like that, to them, it was perfection. But we can kind of perceive that perfection based on how it's being described. And then finally, there's tactile imagery. That's imagery based on how we touch things in our physical experiences, okay? So like with this, each time it's the same. My taste buds shrivel up and die, my skin goes beet red, my eyes well up with tears, my head feels like a house on fire, and my digestive tract starts to twist and groan in agony like a boa constrictor that has swallowed a lawnmower. So we get a bit of uh, uh, a simile here. So you have this idea of a boa constrictor swallowing a lawnmower just to really feel how bad this guy's digestive tract is feeling after eating a high spicy food. We get like the taste bud sort of thing, but like feeling our skin go red and our eyes feeling like they're going to wheel up with tears and just your head feeling like it's completely overwhelmed. The idea is like, okay, you've eaten something spicy. So here's the sensation that that feels like. And we may have just immediately go to reaction of something in which we had something spicy. And it's one thing to say like, oh yeah, it's spicy. But for him to give that description and give us that feeling, that sensation, we can truly imagine it and encompass it uh, much greater as a result. So how do you create your imagery? So that comes down to your voice, who you are as a writer and how that conveys itself and how that comes out through your word choice, through your diction, um, even through your imagery and things like that, right? Who you are as a writer when it comes to your own unique thing, right? If you um, try to do some things like sticking to a particular pattern, maybe using some unique syntax or the way you structure your sentences, um, or even trying to do some literary risks, uh, you can up your literary voice, okay? So let's take a look at this. One thing you could do is maybe do short, choppy sentences, right? Maybe even with fragments. So break things up a little bit. Um, and so it's not just this long, consistent sentence sort of thing. Uh, by chopping it up, you kind of create a uh, dissonance a little bit. So your reader gets uncomfortable because they don't have something to latch onto. So like, there was a flurry of noise, screams filled the air, voices stacked on top of one another, high-pitched squeals, 
low room rings and bellows. All of the pitches and decibels were hit. It was as if the keys of a thousand pianos had been hit simultaneously with no purpose or rhythm. It was chaos. Then, without warning or provocation, there was silence, stillness. So by having these choppiness and these things like they're, they're just kind of jumping around a little bit and even a couple of fragments in here like that, it gives us a sense of discomfort, right? We don't have something to link up to. We kind of have one with this long sentence here, but by having that, it actually gives us even more oomph to go along with it. It was as if the keys of a thousand pianos had been hit simultaneously with no purpose or rhythm, right? All you detect from this entire thing is noise, and this noise is discomforting. It's not easy to comprehend because we can't link up to one thing in particular. You could stack up your dependent clauses. So let's say you have one long sentence. In fact, this entire thing right here is just one sentence, okay? So maybe you have a long stacked sentence filled with dependent clauses, again, giving you kind of this weight, this heaviness almost to it. Because when you start adding more and more and more and more, it makes it so, there's so much to encompass, uh, encompass in just one sentence right here. After the cold, oppressive wind attacked the branches of reckless abandon, the pelting hell cascaded onto the roof. A deafening orchestra of percussion and chaos filled the hallways, and the already strained attention spans began to implode. There was little chance that the class could be contained for much longer. So, so much of this is being kind of stacked on top of each other, on top of just this one independent clause. This one right here is our independent clause. And everything else is just lay laying on top of that, stacking it, building so much kind of like stress almost to the reader that you feel kind of that sensation almost of being kind of stressed by what's going on. You get a physical reaction almost to the way that the paragraph, or in this case a sentence, is simply structured. Another one you can do is a repetition of phrases and clauses and clause structure. So doing the same kind of setup over and over again. We'll look here. The goal was in sight. Andres knew he was all alone except for the goalie. Every muscle in his leg ached. Every hair in his head was pulled by the wind in his face. Every breath was welcomed by his burning lungs. Every step was accompanied by grasping to his legs. Every sound was deafened in his ears. Yet the only thing that mattered was the man facing him at the end of the pitch. So with this, we have this repetition of every, right? Every, 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 right? And then we have the was welcome, was accompanied, was deafened, was, right, all across the board, right, every time, was pulled, this stacking of the same sort of thing, and it just keeps driving home, driving home, driving home, every single thing, right, we have every step, every muscle, every sound, every hair, right, it's all going together, and you can see just what it means by every single one of them, all of them, all working towards this one particular motion and with this we're shooting for that tactile imagery. You'll notice how a lot of these play on different senses of imagery, right? Here we have tactile in the previous one, auditory and a little bit of tactile as well. Definitely tact definitely auditory in this one. We can also provide excessive details in lists. This is a life of pi sort of thing. This is a Yan Martel move to have excessive detail and lists. Right, just things stacking on top of each other so that you can have a complete viewpoint of what's going on. So like this. Walking through the aisles of the store brought a veritable rainbow of colors. Reds, violets, yellows, greens, purples, blues, every shade of gray, white, black, and in between. Hep's eyes couldn't comprehend every candy bar, chocolate, hard candy, soft candy, chewy candy, licorice, gum, confectionery, nougat, cookie, cracker, or biscuit. It was all too much for a small stomach, but his eyes continued to feast endlessly. So this is a great imagery example right here. And we start with all the colors, and then we get into all the very varieties of like snacks and treats, right? To really give us an idea of like every time we see a color, it's, that color comes to our mind. We think the red, we think the violet, we think the yellow, the green, the purple. Every time each candy is mentioned, we can see uh, a chocolate, a hard candy, a soft candy, a chewy candy. All these things come to our mind if we can get this full picture of what's happening in here by giving us these details and these stacks like this. Another one you can do is dialogue, especially immersive or varied dialogue. We get kind of locked into this idea of what dialogue needs to look like and how it needs to work, but by changing it up and doing something different, we can actually provide a bit more immersion. So like this, did they get to you? He motioned towards the girl's leg. Nah, she responded, you sure? It was close, too close. They didn't get that close. Come here and sit down, I need your check. Fine, no, it's fine, they didn't get me. Don't care, I still need to check. 
She turned away under a stare. How bad, how bad is it? Not bad, I swear. She continued to turn away, but he, couldn't, he could already see the tears welling up. So here we have no dialogue tags. And we have no, well, we have dialogue tags, but they're not separated out by punctuation. We have no quotation marks whatsoever. We also have some uh, spelling differences, right? Get, I need your check, right? Pot, don't care. We get that, um, uh, the, the way that they're speaking, right? That, uh, that verbal um, speech and dialogue characterization, right? To give us a little bit more of an image here and seeing how they're doing it. And then we also get some motions to go with it, right? To kind of continue along. So having this, no punctuation to separate us out, no quotation marks or anything like that, it's just the pure unadulterated scene, we can kind of immerse ourselves in a little bit, especially if we read it out loud, we can kind of get that um, aspect to it. And even having just the part in italics, right? They didn't get that close. We can give that emphasis. So all of those examples I gave you are manipulations of syntax and diction, right? So syntax is gonna be how sentences are structured, and then diction comes down to word choice. So the words we choose to utilize in certain instances, and how they compare and balance with one another, and then how those sentences are built on top of one another, okay? So authors are gonna alter all of these to achieve a certain purpose. That could be characterization, tone, mood, any of those can be impacted by diction and syntax. So as you guys are writing, think about what kind of words am I choosing and what kind of words am I utilizing to convey a certain message? And could I change the message by changing a word or two here? And then syntax. How are my sentences structured? Are they all the same way across the board? Do I have repetition of the same phrases coming along? Do I have certain stacking elements to it? Can I change things up and what effect would that have? Can I keep things the same? And what effect would that have, right? Don't get locked into this idea of, I just need to write something with perfect grammar or perfect setup or anything like that, okay? That's what makes sure, that's what ensures that your writing reads like everybody else's, okay? If you really wanna get good at this, if you really want to try to make something different and really develop your voice, take some of those risks, do something different, okay? And you may find that in your readings, when you're reading with your, your peers, that they may say, oh, this comes off as confusing. That's fine, okay? Change it up a little bit, get rid of that confusion, but don't just say, all right, screw it, I'm not gonna try to take that risk because that is how you develop your voice, taking those risks and doing something different, okay? So at this point, I'm gonna have a practice assignment for you guys as far as developing and writing your own imagery passage based on uh, whatever imagery you want to evoke. I think imagery is going to be a strong element to your short stories that you guys have, and I ask that you guys really emphasize your imagery and make that a focus as you go through. Because we are trying to duplicate something similar to what Yan Martel does in Life of Pi, I really want to make that an element for you guys, okay? That's all I have for today. I've been talking nonstop, and it's crazy to me. <laughs> um, but hopefully you guys take a lot away from this particular lesson, not only in terms of just reminding ourselves and reviewing some of those literary elements, but how you guys can make your writing better as well. If you guys have any questions, reach out to me as always. Um, but yeah, I appreciate all you guys. Looking forward to having live lessons again next week. And uh, I also didn't realize how much I hand talk until I reviewed that particular video. So I'm learning a little bit more about myself. I'm having to watch myself teach, I guess. But uh, until next time, guys, thank you. Appreciate it. We'll see you later.